Okay, and we are live. Um, so welcome back to another episode of Light Movement, uh, a podcast brought to you by Milan Art Institute. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to level up your taste. Um, but last week, we're just going to do a quick recap. Um, Dimitra, what was some of your favorite highlights from last week? Um, I feel on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> last week was... We talked about what is light so movement. so long ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah what is light, li- light movement? Um, I think it was really good to talk about that. And I think we could have gone a lot longer because mm-hmm. it's such an in-depth topic. And mm-hmm. I know it really resonated with people. But basically, um, probably my favorite part was just um, probably listening to you, you know, talk about oh. just... Because I feel like, you know, God mm-hmm. gave that to you and like really gave you the revelation. So it was really cool to hear. And I definitely recommend you guys check out that podcast if you haven't listened to it yet. Yeah, so you can find that in our uh, channel. Uh, if you just go on our channel, uh, and if you're not subscribed, make sure you subscribe because we're going to be doing podcasts every single week at the same time. Uh, and next week, we're actually going to have a special guest, uh, Daphne. So Daphne is going to be on the podcast with Ellie, and it's going to be the two of them. It's going to be really fun and exciting. So, uh, But anyways, let's get started talking this week about how to level up your tastes. So um, I got some questions here, but... First of all, I just want to like, what do you guys think is like the difference between like taste and style? Hmm. Like, cause like we, you hear a lot of people say like, you know, finding your artistic style and how, what would, what would you say is like the difference between like finding your artistic style versus like developing yeah. your taste? Well, I think your taste informs your style yes Hmm. but your style doesn't inform your taste so much your style emulates like what what you're drawn to like your taste is the things you love and what you find beautiful and whatever i think that's more like your aesthetic i think your taste is like your level of because like it's like the general it like describes all your things that you find aesthetically pleasing like it describes your aesthetic well, like, I think you can have, like, an aesthetic for um, for horses, okay? But um, so, like, maybe somebody is like, wow, a horse is my favorite animal, and that is a part of my aesthetic. I think they're beautiful, they're powerful, they're, like, the way they move and all that. But maybe they start out with, like, a rodeo quarter horse or something like that or kind mm-hmm. of this, like... Because it's 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 what their eyes have seen that they've only been exposed to a quarter horse and maybe like a Shetland pony because they grew up with one or an old but, grandma horse. Yeah, an old, or an old grandma <laughs> horse, some old sway back, bony my horse, the <laughs> bod crane kind of style. Yeah, Carmella. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like you, when you were thirteen, I your aesthetic has it's been for a horse. Changed. Yeah, yeah, but when you were thirteen, it was like a white magical. Mm-hmm horse but now that you know better she's an old lady Mm -hmm. you know and it's like yeah I don't know so I'm just saying like um it's really hard to describe yeah so I think like your taste is has a lot to do with educating your eyes educating Mm. what you've been exposed to and interesting and what rubs people the wrong way about taste of course i'm sure you would get into that i'm probably ahead of the ball yeah this is a controversial topic it's a very controversial (laughs) topic i I mean you guys didn't know but elevating your taste is an extremely controversial topic i have made (laughs) so many people mad as students talking about this so honestly when i first heard you talk about it i was like I don't have bad taste. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You definitely did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wore sweatpants everywhere you went. Now, Not only that, you wore wear cut-off sweatpants. He does. You wore cut-off oh sweatpants. Oh my gosh, I remember that. I mean, you still Shorts. do, and that's fine to lounge around. But you would go out to Actually, dinner. Actually, I don't anymore. But, but <laughs> you would go, he, he you would go out to away. dinner with cut-off sweatpants. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was like a statement. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I had horrible tastes, honestly. And I <laughs> I still have bad taste, but... <laughs> All right, catching on. Yeah, so... Me too, I have bad taste. Okay, so we should explain to people probably why we're saying we have bad taste. So, Ellie, do you want to, like... <laughs> well, the, the first uh, step towards elevating your taste is admitting that you have bad taste. It's like overcoming alcoholism. you have to admit that you're an alcoholic oh right right so 
Right. Uh, so you have to. Horrible analogy. <laughs> terrible analogy. But um, now we're really going to make people mad. Like, <laughs> OK, so, yes, you have to you have to acknowledge that you can grow. You've never arrived is the moral of the story in taste. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. if you think you've arrived, you guaranteed have bad taste. Yeah. The people who some some of the people who uh, I don't know, it's like. I know people who think they have amazing taste and they're just like they pride themselves on their taste and they just think that they are the most fashionable, uh, have perfect taste. They ooze taste. They <laughs> ooze taste. And maybe at one point that was true, you know, when they were a teenager or like in their early 20s or something. But now that all these years have gone by and they're in that identity, uh, they haven't elevated their taste because times change, uh, culture changes. Uh, what's out there and available to us changes. Um, styles change, color palettes change. Yeah. Uh, things change. And um, I think taste, unlike style, is a little more um, flippant and ephemeral. Like it 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 goes away quickly and it, it evolves hmm. quickly. And I, I think it goes with the times and it, it'll cycle through every few years. So you, you constantly have to elevate your taste and not get too comfortable. Um, whereas with style, I think that um, it, it, it evolves for sure, mm-hmm. for sure, but at a slightly slower pace. Mm-hmm. And again, I think your taste informs your style. So. Do you think that taste is like sort of like an outward thing? Not like necessarily outward, like it's only, but like taste sort of has like a, like it's society sort of, I don't know what I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to. It follows culture. It like kind of follows culture, but like at like the right same now, time, it's like a personal thing. Yeah. But like it almost like changes, like when you were saying that it like, it, you constantly have to elevate your taste. It just made me think like, is it, something that's sort of like a outward expression? Or? I think so much goes into it. And this is the part that rubs everybody the wrong way. Money. I was mm. just thinking that like yeah, earlier. Okay, we were talking you about it. Then you say it. Then you say what you were going to say. Well, I mean, we're probably saying the same, like similar things, but that's why I think it's so controversial. But let's let everybody, you know, get mad at you instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's call it wealth yeah, instead of money. I guess we can start a, a more harsh word. wealth. Yeah, <laughs> wealthy people have good taste. That's just the truth. And the higher, like, the more money you make, the more. I mean, I would say you have better taste. Pretty much, like, if I don't know. I mean, it, yeah. when you look at their houses, or I think you have to start with like thinking as an artist, you want your art to be eventually worth a lot. Like. Maybe not hundreds of thousands. Like who knows, who knows if that will ever happen. But just like having a goal in mind that you want your artwork to be more valuable. You want it to be in beautiful homes. You want to attract those collectors who have money who can buy art, mm-hmm. and those people have good taste. Like you want to attract. I mean, if you're if you're selling art for cheaper, then you're going to attract people that, you know, like buy cheaper art. So. Um, so keeping that as like keeping that in mind as an artist, um, that's why we're talking about leveling up your taste. Like that's why it's important to constantly grow and think about like expanding what you see and try to imagine your artwork in the most beautiful home. What would it look like? And it's gonna it ha- it will cause you to like create different artwork. And it's like you say, you never arrive. You're just constantly chasing it. Yeah. I think I think one of the reasons why um, the money or wealth topic is touchy is there's a lot of uh, jargon and concepts and ideas floating out there in um, culture these days and and the sort of community conversation that um, you know rich people are stereotyped as a certain way mm-hmm. and of course there's going to be some truth to that right there's going to be a, a, a few rich people that that you know fall in line with that stereotype but not all mm-hmm. and not probably not even most and there's um, going with that a bit of uh, envy jealousy uh, you know poverty mentality it's the people mm-hmm. criticizing rich people are usually people who don't have money and want money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, and really, if you just think of money is not evil, 
uh, it, it's inanimate. There's, it's not evil and it's not good. It's neither, neither nor. It's yeah, it's just energy. It's just energy. It's just, it's just um, resources. And whoever possesses the resources, what's in their heart, is mm-hmm. what will dictate what Definitely. they do with the money, how they represent themselves with the money. Yeah. And I think that there are very amazing, beautiful, loving, fantastic, courageous, inspiring. Uh, people who have no money um, or have a little bit of money or have a mid amount of money and a lot of money. There's also wicked, awful, yucky, you know, you name Mm -hmm. it, uh, selfish people who don't have money, have a little bit of money, have a mid amount of money, have a lot of money, have a ton of money. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't think that money creates your character, your character of what makes you good or bad or otherwise. It's just... um, So I think that one of the reasons why it's so touchy is there's this perception that people with money are somehow uh, detached, uh, you know, um, living because we see this sort of Hollywood celebrity status with money and a lot of times that's how they live or they're perceived to live or Mm -hmm. the the media makes them look like they're living. Mm -hmm. And and I think that um, uh you know, there's there's sort of this perception about people with money. But the reason why people with money or with those resources tend to dictate or have the better taste yeah. or command the level of taste mm-hmm. that all others are sort of aspiring towards, if we're just honest, um, is because with those resources, they're able to expose themselves to a lot of things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you, if you, if you ha- have less money, or very little m- extra money, you probably aren't going to travel. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to eat out at you know f- nice restaurants with f- fine food that took a lot of care and time, you know, to make and literally leveling up your taste, <laughs> right? And and you're 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 going to drink Budweiser instead of craft beer. Mm-hmm. You're going to drink right because yeah. you have to make these concessions based on your budget. Mm-hmm. So people with more money have more freedom typically. A wider variety of experiences. To have a wider variety yeah. of experiences. And and that's what, so basically, I think it's ed, it's a, not education as in classical education. I just mean education as an exposure. Experience, yeah. And experience to more things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think travel is a big part of it um, that, that will always sort of elevate your taste because you're exposed to other cultures, the way other people live, other styles, other, you know, what other people are doing. I think... Um, you know, being able to, um, you know, be in in circles or with, uh, you know, even malls or restaurants where where people with money go are going to expose you to other things that you wouldn't normally see at mm-hmm. Walmart. Yeah, let's face it, Walmart's bad taste. Yeah. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. It's uh, Target's <laughs> like a little bit higher. <laughs> Then you still, got still not good. J C Penney's or no J C Penney's is not no high taste. No, oh, okay. I'm saying it's a little bit better in Target. Uh, Target's like a grocery store though. Yeah, yeah house, they're not in the same. Yeah. Well, whatever. Yeah, I'm just saying there's levels of Whole Foods. of stores. Okay, Whole Foods is probably yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whole Foods is is really high end, and of course everything costs more there. And mm-hmm. then you got everyone just shopping on Amazon. <laughs> Amazon's the new online Walmart. Yeah. Really. Well, it's kind of like the online Walmart, but they actually have like. They have good I mean, brands. they even have like North Face on there. They have like. Yeah, that's true. You can buy like. But they always have there. the like, lower end or last year's products, or yeah. you know, they don't have. If you want like like free people, they have free people on Amazon. But Shh, don't tell Demi for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always like last year's sale cheaper. Mm. They don't have <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They don't they don't have like the new stuff that's out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I what I've been thinking about is that everyone deserves to have good taste. Like everyone can achieve that and it starts with you believing like that you you want to change your taste. You want to cuz what you focus on and you you're going to start to attract and bring mm-hmm. it to yourself and it will definitely reflect in your art. So the more you can expose yourself to new experiences, I think a really simple way to like start this process is just spending a lot of time on Pinterest because you can look at interiors, you can look at um, fashion. I mean, all these things can definitely ele- elevate your taste and just like 
yeah, that's my advice. Well, and then you said something that I, 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 I kind of disagree with a little bit um, in that um, I think it's true that typically, generally speaking, people with um, more money t tend to have better taste. Mm -hmm. That's true. I agree with that. But I don't know that there is a lot of really, really wealthy people I, I see sometimes and what how they are. And I think they have terrible taste, mm -hmm. <laughs> like terrible taste. But yet they're able to expose themselves to everything. And I they still have, you know, it's almost like those extremes of uh, showiness and wanting to flaunt for others mm -hmm. and it's not a genuine it's not coming out of genuine aesthetic or mm -hmm. a genuine like appreciation. attraction appreciation. And appreciation yeah so I think having good taste has to also have virtue attached to yeah, it yeah I totally agree because there's people who have money but no virtue yeah that makes sense and then Definitely. you see poor taste yeah mm -hmm. or they act in poor taste you know they behave in poor taste yeah. They're not polite. They're not. That's true. It's not just materials. It's yeah. like it's like taste is like how you conduct yourself. It's mm -hmm. like taste is like how you speak. Taste is like the language that you choose to use. That's like bad taste if you're, you know, foul mouthed sailor, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. it's like that's just bad taste, you know? Yeah. And, and in the music industry, we see a lot of billionaires with bad taste behavior. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And songs. There's bad, even a high virtue. there's even a high end uh, brand called Bad Taste. Yeah. Wow. Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's such an interesting topic. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the keys to uh, having good taste is exposure. I, and I also want to say that you don't have to have a lot of money to have good taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just. But thinking... you do have to put effort into exposing yourself to things that are you know, higher end, high quality, look for quality. That's mm. what I was just and, thinking. And usually yeah. quality costs money. That's why wealthy people have good taste because mm -hmm. they are buying high quality things that cost more. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. And I was thinking the exact same thing. And I really think that traveling like has definitely helped me find like even when I was younger, just going to Greece, going to those bazaars or, or cool shops um, with like handmade leather things like that was the first time I was exposed to that and then I started really, like really caring about having like leather purses or leather shoes opposed to like you know cheap ones that fall apart and so forever 21 purses yeah and, <laughs> and so like I really think traveling is definitely a good place to start if you can travel it's um very life-changing when do you guys think that you first started to realize that you had bad taste Um, I know when I did. It was when I took the mastery program. <laughs> I think I think it was no, when like, I think it was when like, I, oh, I have bad taste. I think it was when I started the school <laughs> mm -hmm. and I and and I started having like teenagers about the same time and um and I started to look at why do some of the students I mean have bad taste and and just what they think is good art because they would bring to class like things that they thought was good art. Oh, it's so tough. And I would, and I was like, oh, it's so tough. you know, like it's 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 just dated, mm -hmm. you know, dated, and and I mean, and so yeah. I was trying to figure out like how do you, you know, and then I realized well maybe compared to, you know. Uh, art that's in Target or Walmart, you know, on the in the decoration department, right? Those prints and things. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you know these students have good taste, you know, and then maybe you know me compared to those students, I have you know good taste. But me compared to other people, right? I have terrible taste. Mm. So then I so thought it's all relative. It's all relative. Yeah. So then I realized, well, if I want better taste. You know, then then I have to acknowledge that I have bad taste, and I have to work at constantly mm -hmm. exposing myself to new things. And you know what I tell the students all the time is feast your eyes. What you what you look at is going to influence and inform what you uh, what or or you know your style or what you uh, think looks good. Yeah, your input influences your output. Yeah, yeah, and and so you have to really put effort you know, into looking at all kinds of art, mm. all kinds of art, 
you know, and, and trying to find the highest quality art. And art is different, I think, than like, say, shoes. I mean, we know if they're, if they're leather, if they're, if they're you know, I, what I learned about shoes is I uh, started looking at shoes that are made in Israel. And if, Interesting. Yeah, and when they have the, um, what do you call a shoemaker? Cobbler. cobbler. When they have the <laughs> cobbler's marks. Thanks, Dino. I knew Dino would know. I knew it. Okay. Uh, if they have the cobbler's marks, those are going to probably be really nice shoes, exquisite shoes. So when I don't know. It, yeah, yeah, what is what a cobbler's it, mark? So be? you know that uh, shoe store in Arizona, Shoe Thrill, that yeah. we used to go to? Mm-hmm. At least half the shoes there uh, were handmade. Uh, in Spain, uh, Italy, uh, uh, Israel, there's there's certain countries that are known to make shoes, and and they have like they're handmade by a single single cobbler, and lo- you'll see the cobbler's marks where they mark the leather <laughs> on where they're going to drill or sew wow. or, or whatever, and and from the pattern. That's and so cool. Interesting. What does the mark look like though? Like it's like I don't know. It'll be like a notch or an X uh, or, or okay, something. Okay. I, I have a few pair of shoes. You got with like it, a I pen mark on there, like yeah, a yeah. circle. <laughs> yeah. And so, and and each one's a little bit different. And I mean, not That's to say cool. there's there's and definitely f- high quality factory made shoes. I'm not saying yeah. there isn't, but and you could probably judge the quality of the cobbler by the quality of the mark you made. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure if you really knew your stuff. Yeah. yeah so. But anyway, the the whole point is, like, I didn't know any of that stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, I used to go years ago when you guys were little. I would go to Ross or Nordstrom Rack or something like – Nordstrom Rack was like, well, I'm getting something nice. <laughs> and um, and I would buy, like, cheap, you know, $20. I would always look at Ross for, like, you know, certain brands I knew were higher quality. Mm-hmm. But I would get basically cheap – cheap shoes you know all the time and then at a certain point once I bought a like a pair of like hundred dollar shoes I was like all right that redefines shoes can't go back. you can't go back you know and and you know and then and those thresholds get m- the more exposure you have those thresholds go higher and higher mm-hmm. yeah and I would rather buy one pair of 250 300 dollar shoes per year than you know 10 pairs at 20 bucks yeah, for sure. I mean, if you want it to last, you know. Yeah. And I think that's important too. It's like it's like it's not just when you buy stuff, but when you make stuff. Like I think earlier when you said you were talking about um the student like you recognized that this like when you f- discovered that you had bad taste it was because you saw others, you know, that made stuff that was just dated or brought in art that was dated and it made me think like I think probably the best taste is stuff that has like a sort of timeless feel to Definitely. it. Definitely. You know, like a timeless element. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, but that's that's even a style too, <clears throat> you know? Mm. Like really? that, that, yeah, like classic, timeless, you know? I feel like a- that's why abstracts are pretty high taste. I mean, mm-hmm. depends on the abstract, of course, but most of them are like really timeless. Yeah. Well, the moral of the story, though, is that what you have is you would have, uh, you know, like me. Let's I'll use myself as an example so I don't make anybody mad. Um, <laughs> you know, when I first started out in art, I was in my 20s. I had not been – I mean, I was exposed to things, but, you know, uh, I – yeah. I mean, I probably com- – compared to the average 20-year-old, I had been exposed to some things. I mean, I, I lived in Greece. I traveled, you know, but – compared to, you know, what I've been exposed to now, my taste was really bad, you know, back then. If you think it's bad now, you should have seen it then. (laughs) So um, anyway, so as a 20 year old, what I thought would look good as art and that could hang over somebody's chair or couch or on the wall in in a room was at a certain level and it was pretty low, Mm -hmm. you know? And so my price points were for that audience. So that audience that would look at that art and go, wow, that's beautiful that will match my couch, right? That mm-hmm. will go in that room. Mm-hmm. That was for this particular social economic group, right? Yeah. And, and the price point fit that. And over the years, as my price points have, have climbed, and it's, it, it has gone with my taste level. And so if, if you, whatever, wherever your art is at right now, if, if you, let's say you 
shop at Walmart, you, uh, um, you know, grocery shop at the Piggly Wiggly. Or Dollar General Market. Or jo- Dollar General, right? That's um, the stuff that's around us. In yeah. other states, there's probably different ones. Piggly Wiggly, Piggly. I've never heard of that. It's that's in sick. Winder. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That's okay, funny. and, and you, it, Quality like, that's foods. what you've been exposed to. That's what you've been exposed to. And like, you know, you're, um, you know, you're, you're, when you eat out, you know, your go-to is Outback Steakhouse and, you know, things like that, then you're probably, and, and you kind of live in that, let's say, smaller world. And the things you look at online are uh, things that sort of fit in that, in that same box. Your taste level is only going to be to the, those boundaries. So if you're somebody who wants to elevate your taste, you don't have a lot of money. Let's just say you don't have a lot of money. You're you're what, for whatever reason, and like you can't buy quality things. You you're just not in a position to do that. It's totally fine. I mean, I've definitely mm-hmm. we've all been there. Yeah. Um, how do you elevate your taste? That's yeah. What I was and wondering. the great thing is is you you can instead of you know going to Walmart day in and day out or you know Applebee's or Outback Steakhouse or whatever is you could you know skip going out three four times and one time go to the nicest restaurant you can find and just see what it's like yeah you know you could um you could uh you know go to those shopping centers I mean like out here where we live we can we have our choice of we can drive an hour and go to Buckhead right and and we can see some pretty nice stores Mm -hmm. um or I can go oh my gosh Georgia Square Mall is that what it's called what's it no, yeah. what's the one that's here yeah. in that's Athens? That's what it's called. Yeah, Georgia it, Square Mall. It's a, what do they call it, a bismal? I don't even know. A dismal, a dismal, they call it. I think there's J.C. Penney there and other. I, well, I haven't been there <laughs> yet, but <laughs> I've heard it's yeah. like, it's so depressing and terrible. Yeah. So, you know, that would be like the bottom of the barrel. And then there's lots of places in between. So I don't have to buy anything, but to go to a really nice mall in the most like expensive part of town, um, will at least expose you to some other things. And then the internet. You mm-hmm. can follow, you know, what are like the gourmet foodie, foodie food, you know, what's happening in that in that realm. Or or what are... Fashion is a big one. Yeah, fashion and, and home decor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, what is... What, go just research. What does a $50,000 couch look like? Yeah. I mean, I can tell you my couch is not 50000 or even I've close to it. I've actually seen a $50,000 couch. And it was like, it was like a handmade couch and it was like every single thing was sewn and it was crazy. Like I was really? like, so you would love it. Oh. I mean, it wasn't the most <clears throat> practical couch, but like, cause like when you sat on it, it was like one of those like floor couches, right? That's like just on the floor. It's mm-hmm. not like on, above the ground, yeah. but every single piece was like this unique fabric. Wow. Um, and it was like super soft and stuff. Anyway, sorry, I, t- I totally interrupted. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, that's like good input. So. I mean, there's things that are out there. You know, what is what is a hundred thousand dollar watch look like, and why is it a hundred thousand dollars versus yeah. you know a hundred dollars? is important for sure. Yeah, and and not to say you go buy one or, but just why? Why mm-hmm. does it cost that much, and why are people willing to pay that? And um, you know, look at look at uh, penthouse apartments mm-hmm. in in cities that you you know, you like or you find interesting, you know, and what does the decor look like? And don't just look in, you know, uh, you know, New York, Chicago, LA, like, like, what is what is a really high rise in Barcelona look like? Yeah. What does that look like? Expose yourself to things, other cultures, other, other food from other, why do they eat what they eat? What are they? And and the internet is right there. You you can expose yourself. Um, I keep hitting this. You can expose (laughs) yourself to all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pinterest is really good for that. Like that's where I go to get inspiration. And I think looking at interiors is definitely like the perfect place to start and looking at expensive couches and- um, (laughs) But you gotta touch them though. You gotta like go in person. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if you can. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Yeah. (laughs) But I think like just visualizing where your art, like where do you want it to go and let yourself like dream a little and like get like, I don't know, like really it's elevating yourself. It's like to think bigger and to like really like set some goals and stuff. Well, 
<laughs> Sorry. The cool thing about like when you do set out to do these things, it like motivates you too. Like when once you experience the other side, like once you realize that you have bad taste, and then you're like, okay, I want to elevate my taste. And then you go out there and you like find the things that are higher taste. Then it like motivates you because like you want that stuff. Like mm -hmm. you want to live at a higher level once you experience it and, and truly understand it. You know, even if you're a minimalist, like even if you don't want to have a lot of material possessions, you know, that's and that's totally fine. It's not like you can't have high taste if you have, you know, minimal. Maybe even some would say that's even the highest form of taste. I don't know. I, I was but, thinking that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like even at that level, like everything that you have has to be so purposeful and like it's beautiful in its purpose too. Like I think the purpose behind stuff makes it mm -hmm. so like extra valuable and extra, you know, tasteful. Yeah, and also I I mean, uh, just like if you're listening to this podcast and you feel irritated, uh, triggered. Um, yeah, good point. <laughs> you know, agitated. Uh, um, you know, almost everything we say, you're like. No, I don't agree with that or, or something like that. It's totally fine. I mean, everybody's powerful to disagree. Nobody has to agree. But I would challenge you to just go a little bit deeper and try to understand why do you feel agitated? Why do you feel, um, why, why does this sort of rub you the wrong way? Yeah. And explore a possibility about maybe having uh, judgments about money. And if so if you're an artist and you have judgments about money, that are negative, negative judgments about money. Um, it's uh, not good. It's 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 really not good. It's gonna it's gonna be to your detriment on getting your artwork out there and getting your voice heard and and having your ideas be known and and what you find beautiful known for your voice to be heard. So uh, having judgments and hangups about money is is something that you have to try to identify. Where does that stem from? why are they there and uh usually goes back to uh something you know we're raised with and we have to look at our parents and their attitudes about money um we have to look at you know uh uh you know w what was our first encounter with wealthy people or hearing about wealthy people what were some attitudes we picked up what are some belief systems we have about uh people with money and because one day you're gonna want to be in in an art show and have your artwork on on some beautiful walls somewhere with some gorgeous golden light shining on it and you're there dressed nicely you know in in really nice clothes with really nice shoes on and lipstick and all mm -hmm. and your hair's done you got your nails done and and you're sitting there in that setting and you're having conversations with wealthy people and you're going to want those wealthy people to spend anywhere from you know four thousand to fifteen thousand, let's say, on your artwork, and you're going to want that transaction to happen. Mm -hmm. You're going to want people to buy it, and the people that will buy it that can afford spending eight, ten thousand dollars, five thousand dollars, fifteen thousand, or whatever it is, on a piece of original artwork and value and appreciate what you have put out there so much that they're willing to part with that kind of money to have that, you can't judge them. You can't have judgments against mm -hmm. their money. Yeah. Yeah. It's They'll hypocritical. Yeah. And it's and it's really hypocritical. It's so uh, I think that, you know, it's sort of a baseline point of um, becoming a successful artist and elevating your taste and, and they really go hand in hand mm -hmm. um, is is going to be, you know, uh, what are your attitudes really, you know, about money and having money and people who have money? Mm -hmm. Honestly, the name of this podcast should have been the attitude you should have about money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Level up How your How to taste. think about money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, should we answer some questions? It's it's kind of a, it is a touchy subject though. I, I Definitely. People, it's, it's not something commonly talked about, I don't think. Okay, let's see. Oh, I just saw myself pull out my phone. <laughs> if you have anything on oh, Instagram, too. Man. I accidentally did the wrong settings for the video. <laughs> Uh-oh. So there's no live chat 
Um, oh, no. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, that's, that's fine. a bummer. Um, do we have any questions on Instagram, though? Well, if you have a question or you're fired up and. <laughs> oh, uh, us or? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm, do you know is there any questions? He's reading. Okay. How often do you guys think that you should, like, like you said that it's like a constantly like evolving thing. Like, do you have like, yeah, a, a time where you're like, okay, it's time to reevaluate my taste, mm. or is it like, cause yeah, like, you're uh, there right now, Dimitra. Yeah, I am. <laughs> I think it happens probably four times, like every season. I think for me, like, every season. Yeah, yeah like mm. it's almost spring. And Honestly, yeah, it's like it comes. Oh gosh, I think subconsciously so it happens with when I'm shopping clothes. for clothes. That's yeah. where it starts. Is like. When you are dressed better, you feel better, and you feel really good about yourself. And then, I don't know, it just puts you in the state, for at least for myself. Mm -hmm. Same with, like, having really nice jewelry or, um, I would say, at least four times a year. That is I, so true. Like, even yeah. just thinking about, like, trying to find a short sleeve shirt for this podcast. I'm, like, looking at all my long sleeve shirts because we're just coming out of winter, right, mm -hmm. into spring. And I'm looking at all my short sleeve shirts that I had last year. Like, he wants to throw them all I'm away. Like, man, I could literally just dump almost all of these. <laughs> like, I just want to like go get some Lululemon, some Robert <laughs> Graham, like. <laughs> and next year I'll be like, "This is Lululemon crap." No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever think that I'm about like, Lululemon. So last but. <laughs> year. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm older, so I don't. I don't think I go through that. Like, <laughs> I, for me, the whole elevating my taste thing is. I feel like as an artist, I I want to always push myself. Mm -hmm. I'm always looking for that next level. And for mm -hmm. me, it either is going to be skill or it's taste. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I have um, my skill exceeds my taste. And then I'm like, oh, I have such bad taste. I got to I just I don't even know what looks good anymore. And like, you know, and I, I have this like desire to elevate my taste and explore new things and, you know, check out what's going on in the world outside of my world, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then I'll, I'll really actively start looking into those things. And, um, and then, uh, and then when I feel like, you know, I've, I've put forth, you know, a painting that has, um, you know, that, that exemplifies that taste, you know, that's elevated, then I think, oh, I got to work on my skills. My skills aren't yeah. quite there. And so it's constantly, I'm either pushing taste or skill is how I found. But I feel like I definitely don't do it as often as you. Um, I, I wonder if that's an age thing or just. It might be, but. It could be Demetra's more humble and just know she has bad taste. <laughs> <laughs> I think with her she's house, though. She's constantly looking at stuff, though. Like, yeah. she's like a Pinterest. I'm I feel like Pinterest sometimes, <laughs> Demetra, you help me elevate my taste. I see you do something, and I'm like, that's so cool. You know, like what we did to the kitchen lately. Like, you inspired me from your house, you know, and all yeah, the I new think things you did. Yeah, I think definitely having a new house and you think I have to decorate everything. Mm -hmm. Like, that has helped us. I mean, helped me think Same. about taste yeah. and everything. Like, and filling our fridge with good food is mm, also helping yeah. our taste. Like, just shopping at better places. And <clears throat> I've been making it a goal this year to just have high quality everything. Okay, so, so yeah, wait, there's a few questions. Yeah, we got a question over here. Um, how do you price your artwork? Uh, so I guess it would go with, like, how do you see your artwork? Like, yeah, that's a good question. Value. So for anyone who couldn't hear that, uh, the question was, how do you price your artwork? Um, I mean, you guys both have lots of experience with this. Well, <laughs> I guess there's a lot of different answers, but it really depends on where you're at in your yeah, maybe your artist answer career. for like a beginner and yeah. then like somebody who's been an artist for like a year and then somebody who's been an artist for like five years. Yes, but that still is not like if you're an artist for five years, but you barely paint, that's, that's true, a yeah. big difference. So I think if you are consistently working at your style and you have a cohesive body of work, but you're still evolving and like just running with it. And um, I think at that point and you start selling a bunch of work or like I think when you have a big body of work, you start selling it. And so then at that point when there's a demand for it, you can start raising your prices. So if you're just a beginner, you're starting out, you're learning, I think it's really up to you. And if someone wants to buy your painting, just like let it go for a fair price, like what you 
But what is a fair know. price? <laughs> I, I, it's hard to say. Well, like, I mean, around I t- a few hundred dollars is what I'm thinking. What I tell people, on size. what yeah. I tell people is, if you are a brand new beginner, it's like the first time you're selling your artwork, first time you're pricing it. Uh, the range is is really large. It could be anywhere from fifty dollars up to you know, a say twelve hundred or fifteen hundred. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, typically, though, I'm I will say that. 50 is going to be too low, 1500 is going to be too high. Um, I would say for a beginner, brand new person, you're, you, um, you want to kind of, f- I think it, at that level, it, it sort of depends on who's interested. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you have to kind of size them up and figure out what is that price point that's going to hurt just a little bit, but not so much that they're not going to buy it. Yeah. So if, if let's say they, they do pretty good, but they're not like, you know, I mean, they're not like uh, living paycheck to paycheck, but, you know, they're not like loaded and have a ton of money, but they they just, um, you know, they really like it. They really want it. And you think, you know, they probably have an extra 400 bucks sitting around and it'll maybe make them think about it and they'll have to really want it. But that's a good price point. I, th- I think they have that. That's a good starting point. That's a real good starting point. And then then now y- what you want is to build precedent. Mm-hmm. So they're always you always have to find that starting point. So let's say depending on the size, depending on the materials, um, how much work and effort you put into it. Uh, let's say your range is between, you know, at first three to five hundred dollars, you know, kind of depending and if you're selling them pretty regularly at that, then start charging, you know, six to seven, you know, six mm-hmm. to eight hundred dollars. And then once that that starts getting regular, then start selling them twelve hundred, yeah. you know, to fifteen hundred, um, or or twelve hundred to two thousand. And so as as there's demand on it, and you're improving, you're getting better. You can begin raising your prices, but more and more, but slowly because you don't want to yeah. change prices like four times in a year. No, like maybe once a year. Like yeah. if you're consistently hmm. selling. That would be at the most, mm-hmm. right. And so it's it's really kind of a supply and demand type thing. Now out in the commercial art world gallery scene, which is, you know, not, uh, it's, it's transitioning and evolving. I mean, there's not uh, as much going on, I think, as, as people who just sell it themselves. Yeah, but online. out there in that, in that market, in the actual art market, um, then I think that a beginning point, like a gallery will not even like look at your art if it's less than, you know, $2, 250 a square inch. Um, and, you know, more common is about 350 Three, three to four dollars a square inch is is more typical for an emerging artist going into the gallery, and it depends on where the gallery is located. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so if it's real high end place, it's going to be higher. If it's you know kind of a you know cheaper neighborhood type gallery, then you're definitely in the two dollar range mm-hmm. per square foot, square inch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, those were really good answers. Um, I think you know hopefully there's a lot of inspiration for you guys for that. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, when you first want to sell your art, is it best to get an art publicist or work with an art dealer? Hmm. Is it best to work with an art dealer? Okay, so the question uh, for you guys, if you couldn't hear, uh, was, um, you know, when you're first getting out, starting, first starting out selling your art, do you want to work with a publisher or like an art dealer? So, Dimitri, you worked with the publisher, and Ellie, you worked with an art dealer. So, yeah. <laughs> what I think do you we, guys think? I think we had two different experiences for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, it's really up to the individual and what your goals are. And I think nowadays it's smarter to be like your own business and you're kind of in charge of like the direction you're going with your art and I just from my experience like being with a publisher definitely helped establish me and at the time it was a few years ago it, I mean it helped a lot and I learned so much but I learned through that process that what was a lot better was to just um, like start selling direct to collectors myself and through social media and on my website and that's becoming more like common these days like there's been a huge shift right now where publishers are really like old school and if they're going to stay in business like they're going to have to really change how they do things so yeah I don't know it's up to you and like I guess if you did want one then you'd probably be 
type of person that's not wanting to deal with like the business side of it at all or you just are fine with just pumping out art and just letting it go and yeah, yeah. What, what I tell people on that is I, I think that when you're first starting out working with a dealer or a publisher is is fantastic because it gets you out there like Demetra said very quickly and established and once you have that people can't take it from you 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 literally own that you own because um, your name and your your style and your your body of work is attached to that success so uh once once you you know sort of uh, have a, reached a certain level of success it's really easy then to go out on your own and you all that hard work and everything um, that you put into that and and really that the dealer put in mm -hmm. you're the one that benefits from it mm -hmm. of course dealers hate that that because they just invested dealers and publishers like dealers same publishers thing. same yeah. thing they hate that because they just invested in you and you split and went out on your own um, but it's basically inevitable if so uh, I think it's great to start out with a dealer or a publisher but if you are not prolific and you just sort of paint you know one painting every once in a while let's say you paint any less than 12 paintings a month uh, you you really can't work with a dealer or a publisher no they won't work with you you, you have to be pro prolific. There has to be product for them to sell. And you're not going to make as much per painting. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if your painting retails, now they'll push your prices up. But if your painting retails, let's say for $4,000, you with, with a dealer or a publisher, you might see uh, anywhere from $600 to $1,000 of that price, of the retail price of $4,000. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you were to go sell it on your own on Instagram, are you going to get four thousand dollars for it? Probably not. So, if you're not established, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you if you're prepared to paint a lot and um, and and you're you're you know painting forty hours a week and you're you're really knocking out a lot of work. Uh, I mean, when we were working with a dealer in the early days, you know, we produced uh, about uh, John and I together about twenty paintings a week. And, you know, we were, we were painting, um, you know, anywhere between 60 to 100 paintings a month. And wow. we got out there really fast and we were all over the place. So it really helped us. But we were painting very quickly, um, you know, a lot of production. Just, you know, we'd work on 20 pieces at once and it was just like an assembly line. Just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, full-time job. Full like time. Not, not just dabbling yeah and that's two people yeah two people doing that because we collaborated mm -hmm. so um it, it but it, it helped i mean we it gave us a lot of traction quickly mm -hmm. um now you don't have to be that prolific but the more prolific you are the more successful you're going to be in the dealer and publisher market mm -hmm. now if you don't go that route and you kind of go out on your own um you you have to be willing to show your work everywhere all the time promote 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 you have you know you have to put effort towards marketing branding um you have Products. to put effort into it you can't just yeah paint and put it up on it post on instagram once a week mm -hmm. and expect to get too far yeah well it's been 50 minutes guys yeah uh, <laughs> went by fast yeah definitely been the longest episode um that we've done recently since we started back up but uh it's been a really good one i think that this is like such a good topic and we could just keep going and you guys have fantastic questions too thank you guys so much um i apologize about the live chat next time it definitely will be active so you guys can all use it on youtube um but uh with that let's wrap up and but first before we wrap up uh, we want to start a new segment on our podcast where we ask Demetra and Ellie what's on their heart and what's going on in their art. So um, which one of you guys wants to start? <laughs> um, I guess I can start. Okay. Um, I guess going with this podcast, leveling up your taste, I think that's actually what I've been thinking about lately with my art. I've kind of been feeling a little bit of a block with my art. Hmm. And I mean, my latest piece like I've, I've been, I'm super grateful I have all these commissions I've been working on. Like I had five recently and I'm still working on three. And so that like keeps me going. Like I have to finish those. So there's no time to, to like say I'm an artist block, can't paint on those. But with my own work, just like 
other paintings that I'm working on, I feel a little bit stuck and trying to find a new direction with it. And with the Buffalo piece, maybe some of you guys have seen it. I've put it on Pinterest and Instagram and Facebook and um, I'm, I was experimenting with a new style and I, I enjoyed it a lot, but I just, I don't know. I think I'm just in this place of like, is it even good? And I know other people like it, but like, it's super good, (laughs) but in my, but in my own, like going forward, it's like, do I even like this? I don't know. So that's just been the last few days, what I've been feeling and trying to get through it. And I think making sources has been helping. Um, yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about you? Um, with my art, I feel like I have, I'm at the tail end of, um, like I'm, I was super duper inspired and in like a new cycle of inspiration um, a few, like a couple months ago. And I, I made all these like sources with that vision in mind. And I'm at the tail end of sort of painting from those sources. And uh, so now I'm kind of like forcing myself to do the paintings because I'm kind of already bored with the concept. You know how that goes? Mm -hmm. I'm sort of bored with those images. And even though some of them haven't really lived yet, they don't they haven't like come to life. Mm -hmm. So I have probably like six more paintings to complete before I'm like free. And I'm I'm I have already have new ideas and I'm really itching to do them. Mm. Um, but if I start it now, then I know I'll never finish these six. <laughs> you know, I'll just, they'll they'll be in that, you know, half done pile. So I'm trying to discipline myself to actually finish those. Um, and so it's sort of at this point kind of become labor and less exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, although there's one painting I'm working on I'm still really excited about. Um, the one of the girl in the fire. Yeah. Is the flower one that you're doing or the, that you finished that, you know, we just took pictures of um, not too long ago, is that flower one a part of the old series or the new? Old. Old, really? <laughs> huh. Which just seems like a lot like lighter and, you know. Yeah, I was trying. Well, I guess I was trying something. Oh, you did that one on Art Club, huh? Yeah. Or you started on Art Club. I yeah. S- yeah, that was like a, that was just something I did, yeah, on Art Club for one of the videos. And then and then I got an idea from it mm-hmm. to try um, to see if I can get a glow with a light background instead of a dark background. Mm-hmm. But I don't like, th- I just don't like the, how it looked. To me, it, it looks so cool. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite paintings lately. That's so funny. I like it. <laughs> It's well, like your buffalo. It's like we're the same, I guess, with that. <laughs> okay, you give me the buffalo, and I'll give you uh, a... <laughs> no. She's like, no. She's like, I, don't, I don't actually like it. <laughs> no, no, I like it a lot. I mean, I want to... Th- I'd rather keep my buffalo because... She wants to sell it. And it's not done yet, and yeah. Cool. Um, anything else on your guys' heart? Um, well, I'm just... I'm super excited about... Uh, registration yeah opening. Master Proto. and it goes with like where I feel I'm at n- you know in I mean, I mean even my art like I have this like su- super huge excitement about the future and I just have really I have a ton of excitement about the future I just feel like this next year um, you know there's just so much cool stuff happening and so many mm-hmm. amazing things going on and I feel like Maybe it just happened with spring and things beginning to bloom. I just feel like there's been a turn mm-hmm. and a shift. Yeah, and you I can just feel it. Yeah, I just feel it in my spirit that there's this shift away from darkness. Yeah. And and things are are really um turning and and, and doing great. And so um so I'm just like excited. It's just like it's almost like this feeling of new beginnings or a new start or there's just newness. And so, you know, with the uh, mastery program opening today, mm-hmm. today's, today's the first yeah. day. Today's the first day. Super There's a exciting. lot of excitement out there. And I can just feel it from the students and the new people that have signed up, mm-hmm. how excited they are. And, you know, um, I was getting, I was uh, watching some posts and um, different things on social media where people were saying that they stayed up. Um, and I set their know, alarm. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so that they could sign up, like, uh, yeah. you know, right when it opens. So they got a, yeah, so they get a coach. A, I mean, there's a limited amount of 
personal mentors, you know? Yeah. We only have 135 this time. Yeah. And last time we had like 185 and it went pretty fast, so. Yeah, yeah, so it's, uh, uh, I think it's 125 this time. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I wrote the wrong number then. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But yeah, I get what you're saying. It's space, it's limited if you want to mentor. But um, uh, so yeah, I don't know. There's just like a lot of excitement out there about that. And I'm super excited. And I just love, I love when, um, you know, a new window opens. It's like one of the most exciting times around here. Yeah. And the whole team's like excited. You well, it's know? like a new season, you yeah. know? It's like a new season of people that are like, actively pursuing their destiny yeah it's, and you get like, to watch the transformations yeah. and uh yeah it's just it's just so fun and it's a whole new group of people to get to know and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, new artwork yeah mm -hmm. all the coaches too and there's like usually <coughs> new coaches around the same time right i mean i'm not as involved with the coaching system as you are but yeah. um you know new coaches and all the new coaches talking about their students and mm -hmm. it's just very exciting yeah so. yeah so yeah, so it's uh, you know day one, and we <laughs> and and then you know I'm excited for Saturday, um, our the work our workshop. online workshop, workshop yeah. yeah, and that's five secrets to finding your style as an artist. Yeah, so it actually that's so funny we didn't even like plan it, but they kind of like go together are similar topics mm -hmm. like what we talked about today and you know what's gonna come up on uh, on on Saturday, but you know that's gonna be a little bit more like. In depth. in depth yeah yeah and, and it's more, gonna be like in two hours or an hour and a half right yeah and it's more mm -hmm. about your style versus elevating your taste but yeah. yeah um so yeah i'm excited for that so if you want to you know access the other piece of the puzzle then join us on saturday and if you want the full picture then uh make sure you sign up for the mastery program because that is like you know ellie and dimitra designed that program to be able to take anyone from any level of an artist and turn them into a professional artist in just one year. So it's like, mm -hmm. I mean, we've heard countless testimonies of, you know, people that it's changed their life dramatically. Yeah. So uh, it's very, it's so exciting. Um, this was a really fun podcast. Um, and guys, we really want your um, your input. You know, what did you guys think of this episode? Uh, were you <laughs> riled up in the beginning? Yeah, did we make you mad? <laughs> Are did you we still lose riled up? any subscribers? <laughs> 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 um, so you know, let us know how you how you felt about this podcast. Um, and if you guys have any suggestions for future uh, topics, uh, Dimitri and Ellie are going to be putting on their stories. Um, you know, ask a question uh, where you guys can give them your input on, you know, things that we should talk about in this podcast. So, uh, and make sure you tune in next week at 3 p.m. to hear Ellie and Daphne talk together. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Daphne is Dimitra's younger sister. Yeah. Um, so the second child of the Milan sisters. Um, so it's gonna be super exciting. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, we hope you guys uh, enjoyed this podcast. <laughs>